For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Welcome to His House of Learning. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. Well, we'll be talking about my alma mater, what was formerly known as Vanguard University of Southern California. Well, labeled it, regretfully so, Vanguard University of the Democratic Republican Commonwealth. Hyperbolic title it sounds, but you'll see why. I'm taking through, well, what's been happening to my f yeah, it's, it's not an easy thing because you know, I did indeed love this school. Graduated back in 2013, and wouldn't you know, I didn't plan on doing something for a 10th anniversary, but well, I received these in the mail as quarter, quarterly publications as well as the annual impact report this is the current one for 2023 in reference to the 2022 to 23 year for the mo overall but really it does harken back literally like this is a 10th this is a 10th ever special in regards to because coincidence or lord's timing but when i graduated in 2013 we had a new president and it was a new movement partnership with state government followed by that of a number of the high-end private sectors and now a greater collaboration with that of the federal government in the foreseeable future Iron University of the Democratic Republican Commonwealth well gradually you'll see how all this ties together because this is not this is no longer a local state and I dare I say it even a national higher educational inst you know, inst institution this is a part and a lot of people who have gone to this university or associated with it in some shape or form are gonna say how it's like wow that's some those are some strong claims not just slander regards to what I say, it is indeed a part of what people call the globalization movement. I mean, directly. Openly. But when I first attended, back in fall of 2009, it was quite a, quite a, you know, quite a humble place compared to a lot of the current universities in my former home state of California. But like I said, upon graduation, it seemed like a great timely <laughs> for me to leave, right? <laughs> Oy, changes indeed. It's, it's it's quite something too because here's a little fun fact about me is that I could have easily got into the whole like early on, like remember 2013, so this is before the whole woke thing was, as we call it today, is just a byproduct of, byproduct of our Antichrist culture, went mainstream. I could, I almost got sucked into that at a lower level. I would, I would definitely would have, definitely would not have been a radical by any means, but still, that could have been my trajectory, but due to, well, scripture, grand number of friends I had, as well as really the influence <laughs> to a great degree at the time the influence of vanguard itself i didn't go that route so it's quite something that how much has changed and by all means here's the thing i'm not saying oh no it's a woke it's a full-on woke college and college and it's hyper liberal and progressive and it's it's, it's gonna push forth you know communism oh no Oh no, my dear listeners. 
or viewers, whichever one. I'm going to stick with listeners. That's how I first started, right? <laughs> Anywho. No. See, what you have to understand is all those other schools that are just playing the stereotype. Yeah, they're just they're just warehouses. They're just uh, they're just, you know they're just sucking up funds and you know re and retarding the population for the for the B system in due time. So, when is it going to be? I don't know, but my my you know, my you know, my goodness, they are just ramping things up. This is one of a number of issues I've already revealed to you, shown you, like, and it's not behind the scenes. Like this is all public. In which no 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 we're all that that that's you know that's for that that's for television that's for people to froth with the mouth over and do the whole blue versus red left versus right conservative versus liberal Republican versus Democrat you know nonsense you know theater now this is the real deal what I've been showing you especially with the flourishing series this is really what the future holds. It's really a, a synthesis of the two sides coming together for, well, peace, peace, where is no peace, compromise, prosperity indeed. All in our imaginations, this vain glory. Start us off with Psalm chapter 49, verses 1 through 10, to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. Hear this, all ye people, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline mine ear to a parable, I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth, and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it seeth this forever. That he should still live forever and, and not see corruption? For he that seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Christ's parables are so paramount. You cannot worship God and mammon. You hate one and love the other. And what you're going to see here is just microcosm of that. And it's, it's now a science and an art. So much so that most of the population looks at this and think, oh, this is good, this is great, this is pushing forward the gospel, this is pushing forward you know, the Christ kingdom. No. This is an unholy matrimony between the church and the world. This is child of mystery Babylon. Child of a harlot. Well, give me some examples before we start. And yes, this is actually uh, the image you're seeing is the inside of a brand new building for business and management. And yes, that is one of the newer icons of Vanguard on top, you know, so you got gold and blue. I got in honor the fact that I went to the school and did have its blessings upon me. But <laughs> Lord knows when I actually when I graduated, I ended, I ended up becoming more conservative. Theologically, socially, politically <laughs> than when I first went in even more than the school itself uh and of course since then much more so to speak but you know, and i use conservative loosely because lord knows we need to really god help us with what we conserve t today so directly from the impact report here are a few examples before we get on to our media sources, I mean, really, right from the horse's mouth, people. So, one of the larger projects that'll be complete, that'll be complete uh, in 2024, 
is a three-story, 60,000 square foot freed center. And what is the purpose of it? It's to provide a premier athletic and learning hub in the heart of the, camp of the campus. As the third executed project of VU's 30-year master plan, the Freed Center will be home to VU Athletics, 19 sports teams, and house the kinesiology academic program. You know, remember, uh, kinesiology, study of human anatomy for the sake of, well, really, sports entertainment. So, all the trainers and therapists and whatnot. VU's fastest growing academic program. Because we sure love our bread and circuses. Featuring classrooms, interactive labs, and study spaces. Bear in mind that, according to the impact report, the Freed Center is the second largest financial gift, second largest, the largest, you know, as far as, you know, contri you know monetary contribution in the school's history. You want to hear what it is? I keep skipping over it, wouldn't that be nice? Well, in total, it's $18.8 million. $18.8 million. And you heard, for athletics and specialists to maintain sports entertainment, here it is. Kept skipping over it. And the second closest thing, and this is all based on the last 10 years, the second thing closest thing to that $18.8 .8 million price tag is back in 2013, which is completed in 16, the renovation and expansion of the Scott Academic Center. It's one, actually, yeah, one of the old buildings I remember going there. Some good experiences, and unfortunately, some corrupt experiences as well. But fortunately, they were petty at the time. Oh, wait, scratch that. I forgot. There's the WOGS, that's the third one. There's actually, the second one is the WOG Student Center. Completed in, started in 2017, completed in 2020. And that just has a new dining hall. Farewell, the Modest Cafe. So the, this is a huge building. Dining hall, study and meeting areas. And yes, well, it's gym and fitness center. Yeah, 13 plus million dollar price tag. Oh, and uh, here's the thing. When I read this, don't think, oh, well, that's just Vanguard University. No, if you really look across the board, quote, quote, STEM is not a priority for really anybody. Yeah, meanwhile, in 2017, STEM Outdoor Learning Lab, $350,000. And 2019 New Science Labs at $2.7 million. So, yeah. And yes, it is not a scientific facility, but really, if you look at the scientific establishments, other schools, including technical schools, and you actually observe the funds they receive and where it actually goes, you'll notice it's disproportionately not directly to. The to uh, providing materials, equipment, and not more opportunities for the student body. So yeah, bear in mind, science is, I'll, at some point, I'll be doing a video on, well, the, what we don't know slash the limitations of history, politics, economics, religion in general, and yes, even science. And science has currently hit quite the uh, ceiling. And there's no, f currently, and for actually the last two to five decades, there's really no foreseeable way out of getting beyond that ceiling. So, bear in mind, there's, there's a reason why athletics and, well, what you're going to find out soon, what the top top earner, with the top rec you know, recipient of funding is because yeah science is hitting its limit yes it, yes this technology is improving and all that jazz but no but it's not that's not going to be the mainstay of what keeps the uh, 
the world system wheels turning, especially for the average man. So yeah, the Freed, oh, fun fact, so the Freed Center from the Freed family, that's F-R-E-E-D, they actually, uh, Evelyn Freed has a website. If you go to the website, you find out that she's a supporter of the Crystal Cathedral, Norman Vincent Peale, you know, the power of positive thinking's theology, as well as also a supporter of somehow still a part of the CCCU, Coalition of Christian Uni Colleges and Universities, you know, full of, uh, Fuller Seminary. It's one of the most progressive seminaries in the country. So yeah, that's who, made, that, and she made it, her and her, she and her family made a 10, 10 made 10 million of that 10.8 million dollar contribution. Yeah, so there you go, supporter of or Norman Vincent Peale, Power Positive Thinking, and Fuller Seminary. It was uh, just so kind of, con you know, kind of uh, helping stoke the fires on the quote unquote woke side in the meantime, while promoting Christian quote unquote mi ministry here here in the Orange. Well, sorry, I say here in Orange County because that's where I was for four years. Lord, it. I was not going to live there. I was not going to live there. Overall, enjoyed the school, but I wasn't going to live in Orange County. It's definitely still want to go there now. It's California in general. <laughs> Anywho. What we're going to be looking at... Well, who we're going to be listening to next is... For a while, as I did my research, I was like, okay, well, the good news is is that the schools are, you know, the school of ministry has not been affected directly by flourishing or thrive or any of those psychological paradigms. Unfortunately, I was dead set wrong because the new dean of students, sorry, dean of, uh, dean of the school of education, I think also dean of students too, but definitely the school of education, which is Jeff Hiddenberger, he has a podcast called Love and Wisdom, Education for Love and Wisdom. So, and what was his previous occupation before being assigned to be the Dean of School of Education? The one that trains future teachers, particularly for Orange County. Well, he was an official for the Orange County School District. So you can imagine where his alliances lie and how, much of, and how many connections he still has with his former circles. In fact, and on his podcast, Education for Love and Wisdom, most of his guests, it seems, are from his heyday. So, let's just say that the love and wisdom he'll be sharing is not what quite according to scripture. In fact, before we listened to a, to, to, to a couple of interviews, just portions, a couple portions of interviews, first one he makes with, with a lead of a school district in San Diego, and the second one with a quote-unquote specialist when it comes to kindness at the national, if not international level. Let's see what the Lord has to say, say about a few things. Because here's the thing: if you don't, if you don't know, if you don't know what what you know what the Lord God has to say, what Christ Himself directly said, especially what Christ directly said, because a lot of people. Including Mr. Hindenburger and all, it's, it's like Jesus. You know, this is this is a Christ center. This is a gospel center. This is a, and yet, what does this have to do with anything Jesus taught or said, or even did for that matter? Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. From the, that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. 
Then said Jesus unto his, unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Everybody says, oh, I've heard this before, Tom and again. Does it look like the church at large, particularly these universities, understand what this is? Question is, do we understand what this is? Or are we just going along for the sake of unity, for the sake of solidarity? Yes, and that word has been used in these con you know, within these contexts of these institutions. Are we doing it for the sake of being a brother? Even though it seems like we don't quite serve of the same father. For 25 through 28 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that's some. Um, keep in mind, though, the rewards come in full upon the resurrection. This is what happens when you don't mind the things of God but of men, and try to get as much as you can here on this earth. Like I said, first interview, Mr. Hindenburger, the with school official of district in Escondido, district of Escondido, which is in San Diego, California. Here's what he has to say about about activating love. So this is Jeff Hindenburger's me speaking first. And so why are we in denial? Since we know that's what matters. Why don't we be, you know, I don't know, intentional about operationalizing love in what we do and stop blaming systems that have no soul and no heart or have no ability to reason or have any wisdom. Why are we letting systems lead? We should let people lead and let the systems serve the people to that. To I love those really abstract uh, platitudes. Why are we letting systems lead and not people? You should already know the answers because systems, yeah, they're they're lifeless things. It's the people who make them operational, make them act, make them happen. So you start to notice there's a, and that's the thing about when it comes to love and wisdom. It's uh, it's definitely not a wisdom that recognizes love and a wisdom that recognizes the the darkness of the human heart, the condition of sin. Fact that there is a presence of Antichrist. In fact, if anything, he's speaking with two potential Antichrists. To the ends that we're hoping for. So when when things are going well and people feel good about them, they use the word love. They do. Yeah. They absolutely do. And what's crazy is when they <laughs> oh, it's so simple. But I mean, but but when people are in that mode, like they when love is activated, like, like they matter, like what matters to you matters is something I use all the time. We even have a survey called what matters to you matters survey, you know, what matters to you matters. And then we let that, that information help. We honor that information by financial decisions that we make. For example, in, in our district, uh, we found out something we didn't realize about our students that the number, number one thing that most students really care about in our district is sports, not shocking. I mean, yeah, no kidding, right? Especially when it's the second largest gift. As you can tell, I'm I'm really thrilled about professional sports. Because as far as I'm concerned, college, national, whatever it may be, it's all bread and circuses. It's all it's all Greek nonsense. I'm not saying that all students do, but it was the number one thing. But we were expecting number two to be uh, something like maybe coding or robotics, and it was up there. But number two was cooking. We expected coding, robotics, 
it was up there. Not that high, though. I mean, for, you know, for fair enough people, you know, you can listen to your review and look at the stats, and oftentimes it can be the top five, but not amongst a large segment of the population. So, once again, they're going to be, whether or not you believe it or not, starting this, he's speaking to, remember, a district, so this includes elementary students. So from elementary, if you think it stops there, no, it goes into a grade degree, into junior high, if not high school. This placating. This placating. So once again, if you think that, oh no, there's a banger universities, you know, it's a, it's a quote, quote, Christian institution, of course they don't focus on science. And like, yeah, no, it's, this is, remember, he's speaking to a public educator. This isn't having anything. Like, there's not going to be any. There's not going to be to be, be any top-notch STEM program, STEAM, whatever, for anybody in 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 the near future. It's all so. You know, it's all a facade. We had no idea that our students care. In fact, at one school, cooking outdid sports. So we made decisions. Bread and circuses. At a at the district level to start bringing kitchens and. And, and cookbooks and things that related to the things that matter to the student. And by doing that, we were showing those, those students that sh shared their voice that they matter. Now, I'm not sure where cooking is in the standards, but I certainly know that standards could serve cooking. I'm not sure that cooking could serve standards. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly, when a teacher or when a school or when a district says to kids what matters to, to you, you matters. matters yeah love is being activated oh absolutely that's how love is activated people you just just do what matters to people so if they want to engage in usury sodomy and an abortion you know like yeah it matters to them so I guess we just got to find some common ground and don't just do the democratic thing for the good of this Republican Commonwealth. It absolutely. Is. And you know, when we say that to teachers, it's being activated. When we say that to parents, it's being activated. And, and sometimes it gets mistranslated. It gets mistranslated into what matters to me matters. And that is a different statement. <laughs> If we can all agree that what matters to you matters, we are cultivating a, an environment of understanding. And understand, to get to love, we gotta start with understanding each other. Doesn't, and by the way, understanding should not be confused with agreeing with someone. Right, if we, got, well, if we can all agree that what the other person mat wants matters, but it doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Do you, do you not see the casuistry, the, the Jesuit, the Talmudic, the Freemasonic wordplay here? <laughs> see, we can all agree what the, what the other person wants is do as thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. But you don't have to agree. So it's so you see, so you see, it's 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 fine because you because you don't have to agree. It ma it matters because it matters to them, but you don't have to agree with it. So thereby, it's okay. Yeah. So that's so far. Yeah. You know. See, this is the true message of Satanism. It's subtle. It's crafty. And nor all the stuff where it's like, yeah, just kill babies and rob, loot, and steal and, and sodomize everybody. No. <laughs> yeah, those people are satanic. Don't get me wrong. But that's the, the... Here's the thing. Remember, the game is let's, let's choose the lesser of two, two evils. These people are basically going to facilitate that just to slow gradual you know boiling you know frog in the boiling pot whether or not it's true is relevant frog in the boiling pot method 
Why? Because as scripture says, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you mind the things of men, not of God, but of men. Hold what men desire, what they want, what matters to them. See, we understand each other as long as we value what the other person wants. You don't have to agree with it, but you do need to value it. All right. And the second interview, like I said, is with a specialist on kindness. We need to start with understanding. And by understanding one another, we might find ourselves in a, in a world of creativity and divergent thinking we ne didn't expect to see coming. World of creativity and divergent thinking we didn't expect to see coming. It's coming sooner than you think, people. Well, what are, what are some of the big challenges? Here's a second. Here's a second interview. Challenges that, that students are facing now. I'll say now when I look at education today, we have many of our students and here in Orange County is a perfect example. It's one of the highest achieving county offices or county, I should say, in, in California, 58 counties. We're probably up in the one or two or three bracket of all the 58. And nationally, we're one of the highest achieving counties in the country. Did you hear that? You already know how low California, think about it. You already know how low California is in general. And it's true, Orange County is one of the, one of the top performers. That's the current state of our education across the board, in case you didn't think. Why am I harping on this? Rule of thumb is this. Either you find a private school that hasn't quite drank a small doses of Kool-Aid, which reality is, yeah, they're few and far between. Oh, and fun fact about mine, it's taking quite a few steps going the other direction. Praise the Lord, thank God. All I did was just give my peace, make it clear, hey, you know what? I'm planning on leaving, this is the direction where we're gonna go. They went a different direction, they agreed with me. In fact, we talked with administrators a few, a few times and seems like they do want to heed my warnings because they see that, oh, yeah. So whether or not it was intentional on their part and nefarious on their part, I'm no, not quite sure, but all I know for a fact is, but I do know for a fact is this, people. A lot of people just don't know any, they literally just don't know any better. And I'm discovering that more and more. And so it takes a great degree of patience and tact, but sometimes you just gotta make it clear that, hey, look, this is where I'm at. This is, and this is not going, this is just not, this is not biblical, it's not God honoring. It's convoluted. It's worldly wisdom, and it's only going to cause more trouble sooner than later. So, praise the Lord that we're making a U-turn, and may we continue to do so for the time being. But, so yeah, schools that, schools that are not continually drinking the Kool-Aid, or if not abstaining from it completely and ever vigilant, few and far between. So yeah, with that said, homeschool. If you have children, homeschool. Plan to have children, homeschool. I'm a quarter of the, the, the way done with my book, How to Homeschool in Babylon. To have it out in the early spring, hopefully in February. So we'll see. We'll see amongst a few other resources and whatnot for the following school year. We'll see. We'll see what the Lord has in store. <laughs> so, but in the meantime, be fully aware that there are so many snakes and dragons and wolves in the grass. In fact, if you look at our advanced placement scores, our, our AP scores, and those that take the, the class and pass and those that take exams, it's one of the highest in the nation. It's probably in, in the top five, six, when you compare us even to a state. Uh, that's how well we do here, but we're... Yeah, remember, it's comparing to other people, and most people can't read or do arithmetic, so... Suffering. We're suffering in terms of student deportment, mental health issues. 
And to pour me means a number of things. Including what you're already thinking. We'll get more to that very soon. The uh, amount of uh, drug alcohol abuse vaping today is palpable. And to, to me, that shows a real spiritual void that needs to be filled. You talked about they need that foundation of of belonging, of that sense of this is a place where I am valued, where I can try things and not be considered a failure if they don't go well the first time. If I don't know something, I have teachers and other educators who come alongside me and help me learn what I need to learn. So that sense of belonging can really lay the right foundations for that student's education, their growth, their success. So notice how the specialist I have links down below if you want to listen to you know who everybody is and listen to the full thing. Mentioned all these, you know, yeah, sure, they're doing well academically, blah, blah, but there's deportment, literally from the school, if not the country. <laughs> if, you know, divorce and drug abuse and alcoholism, amongst other things. Yeah, so there's a spiritual void. And then Mr. Hindenburger's like, yeah, so, you know, when teachers value you, so remember, Jeff Hittenberger is the is the dean, is the head of the School of Education. And he just immediately goes to he just completely ignores the spiritual aspect of what this man, what who's who's not, who who is not a member of church, not a believer, brought up. I want you to think about that. It's not the first time too that he does this their ultimate flourishing yeah you know and i'm not and i mean outside of this particular interview outside of this podcast posting yes can you say a little bit about how you see the faith community oh i sure make sure you you like hear this part and other educators who come alongside me and help me learn what i need to learn so that sense of belonging can really lay the right foundations for that student's education their growth their success their ultimate flourishing. Yes. Ultimate flourishing. Says it a few times. It says thrive amongst other things. Yeah, but this. So yeah, he's a he's a part of. He says I'm against the system. No, he is a part of the system. He is a part of the system that is going worldwide. These psychological paradigms that make wokeism look like. I mean, it's 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 literally. The difference between flourishing and wokeism is wokeism is 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 crack. Flourishing is cocaine. That, that's the good expensive stuff. Well processed for, for the higher classes of addicts. Makes you feel good though. And yeah, you know, far as psychological paradigms are, are you know, are concerned, the ecumenical world is concerned. You know, that's that's what matters. Can you say a little bit about how you see the faith community being part of the solution, if you will, or part of the team that's working toward students being able to have a strong mental health and and to flourish? Yes. The faith community is indispensable. I think that for us to marginalize, let's say, churches, perhaps synagogues, and, you know, places where people gather to worship. Churches and synagogues, places where people gather to worship, so yeah. It doesn't matter. Be a melting pot of religions and cults and whatnot. Go America. Is, uh, is um, a mistake. We need to embrace them. They play a role, a very distinct, positive role. I know, for example, in my life, it was the church that stepped in and helped my family during the really tough times we had. I didn't get into nitty gritties, but there were times when we just didn't have any food because, you know, you're getting paid $50, $70 a week and you got to pay rent, you got to do gas bills, all this stuff. Before you know, you've got very little money. So the the whole thing of, of taking, uh, you know, uh, day old bread from people, we did it or making beans and stretching them throughout the, the the week we did it making tortillas my mother would make tortillas they were amazing yeah so he's in case you didn't, haven't figured it out yet he's from an immigrant mexican immigrant family 
love them to this day. She's deceased now, but I loved her to you. And, you know, you um, just get by. The church stood with us, and uh, that provided a foundation of faith for me. And, and I view all of life through that lens. So faith communities really can be one of the key assets for a yes. student um, in this quest to learn, to grow, to thrive in the face of really difficult circumstances. So yeah, that was the foundation of his faith. They, they fed him. Like I said, people, we, it's, it's, it's mammon, the worship of mammon, bread and circuses. You can see that consistent theme, you know, our God is our belly. What's the foundation of the faith? Food. They gave me food. So I'll continue to see them as a positive good as long as they keep giving me food. Truth. The way. Nah. Salvation, eternal life, nah. Nah, don't point me in the, t don't point me to those things. Just, just, just give me food. AKA, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give into the very first, think about that, I'm gonna give into the very first temptation, the very first trap that Satan sets. Is I'm going to choose to satisfy my hunger over everything else when things get difficult. If you satisfy my hunger, I, I am loyal to you. Dangerous place to be. All right, so we're gonna be moving over to our audiovisual source right in front of us. And so, what is the what is this all about? Remember, this is the this is a this is the opening of the Patty Arviello School of Business and Management. Bear in mind that this is the largest contribution. This this facility will be completely done in 2024. Now, just so you know, just so you know that this contribution is so large, it's not even mentioned. And remember, the second largest contribution is $18.8 .8 million for athletics. So, for you know, the art and science of making more money, we don't know, but it's the largest gift. They probably put it there because it's like, it's like 19 million, <laughs> like 19 million, like, oh man, that's, we don't want to put 19 million, put it, oh, the largest gift in VU history, that doesn't look, like, so who knows, maybe that's just part of, just part of marketing, right? Just trying to hype it up more. But yeah, Piety Arviello, School of Business and Management. A few things before we watch and listen to people themselves. On April, this is from the Impact Report, on April 19, 2023, nearly 800 cheering students, faculty, staff, and supporters surprised an unsuspecting Patty Arviello with a take your breath away moment. Patty's husband, Rick, unveiled the name of VU's soon to be launched Patty Arviello School of Business and Management. The Arviello's have partnered with Vanguard's Vision in sponsoring the largest academic donation in the university's 103 year history. Skipping down. This is from Bangor University President or VU DRC President Michael J. Beals, who literally started, like, to me, is a carbon copy of Joel Osteen, just with glasses. We are honored to align our business programs and Patty Arbiello's name because of who she is. Quote, all of us a quote. I'm just emphasizing quote here. He says this. A phenomenal business leader and role model for Hispanic, female, and all students whose life, story, and work demonstrate what is possible. We recognize the impact that Patty Arviello's namesake and support will have on generations of students as Vanguard prepares them for a life of Christ-centered leadership and service. Yeah, fun fact, uh, Patty Arviello and her husband exhibit far as I can tell from anything I looked onto their websites, social media, that includes Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, everything. They talk about money, 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 and everything that's similar to money. 
Oh yeah, they also espouse Oprah, Oprah Winfrey and other ecumenical, open-ended spiritualists. But nothing about the church, Christianity, Jesus Christ, the Bible, nothing. Nada. So. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that, that's who, that's who's, that's who's, uh, this building's being, being named after. Oh, and wait to hear why her husband decided to allow her to have her name and not their name on the side of the building. I think it is important for you to see me. Because what this country offers and why our parents came here, or our grandparents came here, was to give us the opportunity to succeed in a country that has no ceilings, for women either. So my story is important, and I don't do that, I don't say it or I don't share it because it makes me feel empowered. I share it to empower you. So yeah, I've I've I've, a, I've realized I had a free software that helps that helps me trim videos. So instead of just bouncing around awkwardly on the timestamps, I just while I'm doing while I'm segmenting, I can just cut them out. So yeah, I see. I I I'm getting more technologically advanced. It's just. It's just one year at a time. You know, the, the first time I walked down to this campus, uh, at the invitation of Richard Watts, I don't know where Richard is. Mr. Watts, uh, thank you for seeing this before anyone else. You know, I was struck by the students, not just the diversity, but the engagement. It was after that that I learned that Vanguard had been on a three-year journey to find the perfect person to represent their business school. And they concluded that was you. Your journey is so inspiring, from cleaning with your mom to being the founder and CEO of the largest Latino lender in America. You mentor, you inspire, and you support others on that same journey. You've always said people need mirrors, mirrors they can see themselves in. These are your mirrors. And they have no better mirror than you. Congratulations, baby. And they have no better mirror than you. And then followed by a round of applause. Yeah, that was right there at a supposedly Christian school and President Mike Beale's claim is for Christian ministry. And the husband of the woman that they named the building after said, yeah, there's no better mirror than you. You're the perfect person for this. And bear in mind, you may think that this man has his uh, testicles in a vice grip? No, no. If you if you pay close attention to what he says, and literally you go to their website, New American Funding, or PattyRVLO.com, it's very apparent that he knows what he's doing, because well, DIE, Diversity, Inclusion, and, and Equity. Putting his wife in the forefront as an intersectional individual benefits the company in the long term. So, yeah, there you go. See, a prime example of the willingness to sell your soul and for what? <laughs> for what? Just to emasculate yourself on a daily basis, just to push your industry forward. Because, look. And then in the next clip, he's gonna explain why, yo, know, explain why he chose her. He knows what he says. And Vanguard shared that they were on a three-year journey to find the right person to name the school after. So when they approached me, 
I, I saw it as being very fitting. But the question I get asked is why wasn't it called the Arviello School of Business? If you think about colleges all over the country, it's typically not a person, it's a last name. It's, you know, a way for them to leave their mark on society. And the reason I really chose the Patty Arviello School of Business and Management is because Patty deserves it. You know, a lot of people don't know what Patty does in her spare time. I mean, she's helping me run one of the largest mortgage lenders in America. But outside of that, she is really focused on serving the underserved. She's been on the board of directors for Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the largest chapter in America for a decade. And because it's it serves Latino children. I mean, that's who Big Brothers and Big Sisters largely serve, especially in the Southern California market. And she's been a, a staunch advocate for mentorship and finding ways to serve underserved for a long, long time. But it didn't stop there. She started mentoring. She started her mentorship class. She's been doing that for years now. It started out just Latino women, but it's grown into African-American women and women of all races. And even men are asking to join now. So that's fun and rewarding to watch. Yep, see that? Yeah, yeah. And more men who want to castrate themselves just to get further ahead in the uh, private public sector or the public private sector, basically just the sector. Hey, you know, women are, you know, women, the 50% the you know, my, you know, my, you know, minority and she's Hispanic, amongst other things, so yeah just gotta you just gotta belittle your own heritage your own sex your own convictions and beliefs otherwise how else are you gonna move ahead in, you know, in the world and she is now focused on actually financially supporting latina businesses that are coming out so we've financially supported three now and these are Latinas that have started businesses. And as anyone knows, financing is the lifeblood of a business. So she's actually stepped in to provide appropriate financing to some of these Latinos that are in need. And bear in mind, one of those businesses is called Little Libros. Little Libros. It's children's book publisher. And among the titles involve some that teach, well, the Day of the Dead, and every all, and some, you know, some basic occult practices that go along with it, as well as uh, and there's a number of books on a, books and merchandise on astrology, and there's even this one book called The Life of or La Vida Walter. So this blonde-haired kid guy, I'm not quite sure. You know, there's the samples. Don't make that quite, don't, don't really make that too, too clear. Who talks to stars? Who talks to stars? And the stars impart their telepathically. He has a gift of talking to stars. The stars telepathically impart their, their, uh, their millions of years of wisdom to him. And he shares it. <laughs> and he shares, and he's their prophet. And he shares that wisdom to, like, to the world. So, yeah. Books on astrology and telepathic talking to stars, amongst other things, to children. Yeah. So, and her name's on the side of building for a supposedly a Christian university, because after all, she deserves it. So when it came to all those things coming together, it was like, she deserves it. She's doing the work. I'm not. I mean, I'd love to say I am, but I'm busy running New American Funding and some of the things that I'm focused on. Patty is the one that's focused on creating equality for underserved in all the ways I just mentioned. And it makes me so proud that her name will now forever be memorialized with the Patty Arviello School of Business and, and Management at Vanguard University. So that is the reason why that's the name. Yeah. 
he says, he says, she's doing all the work, I'm not. Most of the time, on, when, the, when they publicize new American funding, they put her, like, in the opening, in the opening pages and everything, and statements, they put her as the founder, the president. And then later on, some toys like, oh yeah, no, she was the co-founder. In fact, he actually does most of the work in regards to managing new American funding, but she does a little bit more off the side with all the, you know, with all the social activism. You know, with all the female empowerment and the, yeah, the Latinos and minorities and all that jazz, so. Yeah. Yeah, This next in this next clip, uh, if you're white, you're of European descent, more so than me, I'm like a third at best. And uh, for some reason, you still don't think too well of yourself or think that you need to step aside and let, you know, other people basically replace you. Because, well, apparently you're evil, you're blue-eyed devils or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh... Please stop. Please stop. Uh, just... Please have some... Please... Please, uh, fear the Lord have some children, raise them, and um, teach them that that they're not blonde-haired, blue-eyed devils or, or, some, or something. I don't, I don't know. But anyways, uh, just so you know, to give you an idea of just how prominent New American funding is, see here. So, and look, and this, is, this is from, again, from the Impact Report. This is what it says. She began her career at age 16, learning the mortgage industry from ground up before co-founding New American Funding in Tustin, California in 2003, and growing into one of the largest independent mortgage leaders in the country and the largest Latina-owned private mortgage company in the, in the, uh, in, in the nation. And granted, of course, the co-owners are male husband, but, you know, whatever. He does most of the operations, but whatever. Which... With a servicing portfolio of, of over 241,000 loans for $63.9 billion. Yeah, so remember, these are the minorities, people. These are the minorities. Portfolios of $63.9 billion. The company's Latino Focus and New American Dream initiatives. Because remember, a, Remember, New American Dream, who do you think that mostly applies to? I'll give you a hint. If you know what the term dreamer is, there you go. We're launched by Patty Arbiello with the goal being to enhance the quality of the lending experience for Latino and black home buyers. So yeah, this is a condition of our... Yeah, why don't you think about that? This is... These are our poor, downtrodden, marginalized... Completely can't can't compete due to discrimination and whatnot before the white population, even though whites are especially in California. I mean, whites are literally what, like at best, a, about a third of the population now. Like I'm from San Bernardino Cal, you know, County. I mean, there is most of those cities are anywhere from sixty to ninety percent Hispanic, and they were still saying, "Well, you're a minority." I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> You kidding me? Like that doesn't make it. Anyways, yeah. So much of my life, growing up, yeah. For me, it's like a lot of what you're saying makes no sense at all. Especially when I found out women were were minorities, as they're sitting in positions of power and influence. Okay. Anywho. Uh, just as your life philosophy, Patty, because I see that a lot in terms of you mentoring and helping, especially minorities and women. What is what is your life life philosophy around helping uh, those in need or those considered minority? So before she speaks, yeah, this is literally called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee podcast, based in California, and it, and this is where business leaders, CEOs, including this gentleman right here, get together and talk about well, the current happenings of right of the. Yeah. 
yeah so yeah so this is yeah so let's listen to patty rbl's education vlogs this was actually podcast was actually done earlier this year um so great question i'm often asked um about my role in mentorship um listen I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for mentorship, whether I knew my mentor or not, I needed somebody that I resonated with so that I could emulate, especially in business, right? Especially being a female in business. Um, it was really hard to navigate 30 years ago, 40 years ago, actually, when I entered in the mortgage career, you know, we would show up to work trying to dress like men, act like men. So, you know, for me, finding a mentor was critical. I think now in this time, point in time in my life, I've been doing mortgage for 41 years and my significance comes from growth and other people's successes. So it's like I have all these women mentees that are like my children now. So if you can imagine if you have children and how they make you feel, they, they give back to me more than I give to them because they... You know, I had one the other day came up to me at an event I spoke at and she's like, you know, when I first met you or met this organization that I'm involved with, I was making $19,000 a year as a Latina. She goes, and I'm, I'm going to make 900,000 this year. Wow. So that's like tremendous impact. And I think especially being raised Latina in a culture that's very prevalent in our country, the, the, the there's very uh, few role models for us being the culture we're from, being one of the largest percentage of the population. We have very little representation in business and in media. $63.9 billion por port you know, portfolio. And she's talking to a millionaire as well. Who's Indian for those of you listening. So that's, I think it's important for me to speak, even though I'm not, confident all the time in the words that I choose to speak with but I felt like it's better for me to speak than not speak at all so I do sit on many many boards and I actually become quite frustrated to be perfectly honest with you because we're still talking about the same things we've been talking about since 1994 so when I hear the the phrase oh we're going to get into Hispanic lending I'm like okay really because we represent like the seventh largest GDP in the world yeah. um you know we're tied with France uh where we have a bigger GDP than Canada if you are a business person and you're not focusing on that so remember She's saying seventh largest. Remember, notice, notice the, notice the Orwellian speech here, the double speak. I need to help these disenfranchised, marginalized. There's a, there's a pay gap. There's a, there, there's a wealth gap, but she just, but she's claiming, she's stating, that yeah, Hispanics in the United States make up a GDP that's larger than Canada and France. That's simple business to me, right? Um, but I think really overall, I would I would tell you right now that um, you know the Biden administration came in really strong to make an impact, and what's holding banks and IMBs back is regulation. The regulators that oversee what we do as a business to serve these communities don't really understand our business, so. I think it's quite frustrating for me. So I've, you know, I started a road trip um, probably early February to go meet with pretty much every head of every organization that oversees mortgage lending, not just for my company. Obviously, I do a large percentage of lending to minority communities, but really to help the industry overall. Because, you know, if I do that, then the greater impact to me is even greater because a larger percentage of my business goes to that market. Yeah, um, yeah we need to teach CFPB. We need to educate HUD, we need to educate state regulators on what pricing looks like to these communities, what programs look like to these communities, um, you know, what pricing adjustments look like to these communities. So, you know, that they're, they're not setting a tone of fear for doing these types of loans. And so- Yeah, tone of fear for these types of loans, because bear in mind the one major element that's being left out about this is, well, here's the thing about regulations they tend to affect um, legal status. Because reality is this. Stop. Just the blatant reality is this. A large proportion, and we don't really know. <laughs> we don't really know 
what proportion actually is of those who are Hispanic, Spanish speakers. Bear in mind, that's what Spanish means. Spanish speakers, Spanish is your first language, aka you're most you're most likely not originally from the United States if Spanish is your first language. There's a it's like yeah, regulations complicate things. You know, there's programs and pricing. Like, yeah, because legal status. Notice how she says you know Biden was on board from the very get go. Yeah, of course he just. In fact, it was just recently. Apparently, he just he's letting in what somewhere between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand Venezuelans, and probably gonna give them work permits. So yeah. I can only imagine why that would complicate regulations. And, uh, yeah, we need to stop them from stoking fear about lo loaning money to people who are supposed to only be here temporarily or not at all or something. So, yeah. Remember, her name's on the side of, uh, School of Business and Management. At... Banger University of the Democratic Republican Commonwealth. So I don't blame my com my competition. I don't blame Wells Fargo. I don't blame any of them for pulling away. It's simply not in alignment with regulation. So I think um, where everybody wants to overcomplicate, you know, diversity and inclusion, it's simply choosing and making an effort to pick. I still, as a woman leader in this industry, have to like jump up and down to be chosen to do pilot programs with, to align with other male dominated banks. I'm just gonna say this right now, just to get this out of the way, because I'm gonna say this at some point. That goes, no, you shouldn't be picked. I mean, let, let me change your face. I don't wanna make her look bad, you know, unnecessarily. I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. To... There we go. Yeah, you should be at home taking care of your children and uh, not emasculating your husband and making him look like look like a self-induced eunuch for the almighty dollar just seriously you know i'm like look at me look at me you know and yeah. i think that there's nothing wrong with that but it's or i think that business leaders especially males i you know i kind of I see the lens through people, right? I walk their walk. I don't judge. Even as a white male leader owning an IMB today, which the majority are white male, I understand. Mm -hmm. I understand that it's a little hard when their entire, you know, C-suite is men because they purposely now have to go search for a woman. And what does that look like? It's a little uncomfortable. No, they, no, they, no, they have to. They have to. She keeps saying people have to do these things. But we always want the best person. Wait until she she explains why. It's a part of the it's part of the mammon, religion of mammon. The basic tenet to run our companies and lead our companies. But I guarantee you, if you look, there's an equal woman to an equal man, and yeah. vice versa. So just choose us. Like let's just throw in an extra flavor there. So it's being purposeful is really is really inorganic in your approach. You know, there's nothing to be uncomfortable about saying that, listen, I need an African-American leader. I needed an African-American leader, right? Yeah, because you worship money. Of course you need an African-American leader if you want, if you want to make money from black people, you're, yeah, you have to. You have to do it. Money, if it might money, if you know, the dollar sign is all that matters and increasing your share of the market, by all means. By all means, you gotta just you gotta you gotta include it as many people as you can. You can grow your sixty three point nine billion dollar portfolio because you're downtrodden, marginalized minority or something. I don't know. Just I don't know anymore. Like these people are literally just putting labels on themselves. Like what are you talking about? It's like saying you're anemic and yet yeah, you're you're like in the top ten, you know, strong men. So, um, yeah, I was organic in my, in my approach to that as well, even at NAF. And that was only in 2016 when we started our initiative in the Black communities. I needed to be very purposeful and organic and honest that I may not know how you feel, but I have empathy 
and I'm learning and I understand, like I understand your immigrant perspective in comparison to my mom. So I- uh, She has a black, a black person's immigrant perspective, which tells you that, which gives you a little insight to, yeah, actually a, a fair number of people of African descent are not descendants of the direct descendants of the of the uh, of the transcontinent of the sorry not the transcontinent the trans the uh, transatlantic slave trade like I was. My family's been here since at least the early eighteen hundreds. So for me, it's like I'm a fairly old blood, you know, American, so to speak, in that regard. But a large number of African, large number of people of African descent are increasingly so are not from this continent. You know, for like within like literally like the last three, if not four generations. I think learning cultural um, differences in this country is critical, especially if you run a company. Black culture very different than Latino culture, right? But we're big, powerful cultures in this country. Big powerful cultures in this country, but we're marginalized, we're downtrodden, there's a, once again, pay attention, there's this, there's this, you know, it's literally, the, literally both hands. We're weak and powerless and we need help, but then on the flip side, so yeah, if you're a minority, please, please, please don't do this. Please don't bow down before the altar of mammon and kiss the feet of Baal and especially if you're a man, just emasculate yourself and a woman just you know, sense, you know, if not, you know, be tempted to sacrifice your children, be has the Molech. Yeah, and if you're if you're uh, if you're white and you're male, especially a Christian brother. Yeah. Stand up. Please. I got I got plenty of brethren that I'm that I'm describing across the board. And I want every single last one of you to fulfill the Lord's commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Fun fact, that does not involve doing all this nonsense that they're describing. By a long shot. Yeah, and, and just Purely going back to that data, if 72 or about 70% of net home ownership is coming from Hispanic, about 17% will come from black home ownership. So practically, I mean, that's that's almost 90% of net, humo, net new homeowners yeah. in, the, in the next two decades. And, and you said something very, very powerful is that if your entire C-suite looks like white male right now, then you have to make that uncomfortable decision. And See, you have to. You have to, because remember, you, you gave up having, you gave up being fruitful and multiplying, so just just accept the fact that you're yeah, you know, just 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 keep being sterile and keep your family, you know, just self destruct your families, forsake your heritage, and join us join us in this collective Democratic Republican Commonwealth where we where 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 uh where is where like we trust in god or something i don't remember remember it's all in god we trust because <laughs> i know that they don't really mean that unfortunately you know where god and trust really means the money that it's that it's uh, minted or printed on it's not always because the fact that you don't like working with other people of color or women it's just the fact that you haven't done it in the past so it might be uncomfortable in the in the beginning, but that's a journey we all have to take at, at some point in life because, because that's that's good for community and that's good for the business. So, because it's good for community and business, but really, it's more so good for the business. Remember, this is the this is the public private sector. It's good for community and the business. And if you're probably thinking, well, Christian. You know, he's, you know, at least they're trying to promote, you know, you know, the absence of conflict and violence and people getting along, you know, especially because, you know, what are people, everybody's going to do? Just everybody just, just leaves or, or segregates, like balkanizes to, to, uh, to the other most. Well, before we have any kind of conversation like that, I want you to listen to 
their prescription on how to learn about other cultures, on how to have community with people who are not a part of your ethnic slash racial group. These young, younger generations that are entering the workforce, which primarily a large percentage of them are Latinos, right. they want to work for companies that mean more than just a paycheck. So, um, you know, everybody knows what we're rooted in. And it doesn't mean that sometimes I don't have uncomfortable conversations when I'm talking about women empowerment, knowing that 43% of my company are not women, right? They're men. So I got over that. So yeah, remember, man. If you if you if you want to have male spaces and you want to encourage and edify exclusively men, do it. That's my plan. Fun facts, yeah. My most of the stuff I'm be making, yeah. I mean, you know, the book and the, the curriculum material, male or female doesn't really matter for 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 the most part. But Lord willing, the online or in person in person education that I'll be doing yeah that's that's gonna be targeted towards 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 you know towards men and really and realistically you know there's you know actual statistics which are gravely ignored show that one out of ten women actually do have generally quote quote masculine male generally a mostly you know male interest you know fit in the category of actually having interest in engineering and engineering and the more technical aspects of business as opposed to social activism and, and the sciences and maths and whatnot. So yeah, but it's be geared towards the men and of course that one I take, I've, I've met a few, I've met a few women who, who generally, who do, and, and that's thing, women, women who do love the Lord, young, you know, young women love the Lord, who have those interests, but fun fact, they're few and far between and because they love the Lord, their God and not money. They're, they're, they're willing and ready to step into the shoes of a mother, a wife, and sustain and help their home. So, that's why I don't mind teaching them, <laughs> because well, they live by the law, not D.I.E. Just by data, so I think that just sitting around the one, the, the 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 coffee, you know, have a cup of coffee in the morning, whether you have two employees, a hundred, a thousand, there should be a purpose and a mission to serving communities of color because, like you said, there's the business case for it too. But not only that. There's no competition. NAF doesn't have competition in this space. We're talking about an underserved community here. So. Yeah, and like I said, that's heavily due to their legal status like a lot of these people's le like so there are so many we're talking about millions there are millions of hispanics in this country that have questionable if not clearly don't have legal status so yeah of course they're underserved why would why you know why would americans especially those who've been here for several generations you know what i'm saying just whatever so we may leading the efforts because you have a Latina leader, but you know, there's plenty of room. And I think that that's really what it needs to come down to. Is this something that you can find passion in? Because it's not really something that, that you, we're going to force anybody to do. At least I don't believe that, you know, there's some mm -hmm. legislation that forced certain public companies to have women on their boards and everybody came to you. How do you feel about that? <laughs> like, well, I kind of want to be chosen. Yes, exactly. I want you to have me have to be a part of your company or your board. I want you to see the value in my voice. And so I think it's just really something that every company should be talking about. I want you to see the value in my voice. Notice that. I want you to value me. I want you to affirm me. It's really not much. If you pay close attention to the language being here, it's not so much as far as skills and contribution. It's, I want to be picked. Remember, it goes back to Dr. Jeff Hittenberger. It's, it's like, you know, you know, what matters to you matters to me. <laughs> but we don't have to agree. It just, I just have to value what matters to you. In finding their passion to serve communities of color in our country and learning about our cultures. I mean, fundamentally, it's so easy. Want to listen to how easy it is to learn about other cultures? You really want to know?
remember, remember the other dude's like, yeah, it's it's for it's for community and the business. Uh, it's definitely business, especially for Netflix. I do videos at NAF and I teach people how to be culturally centric. I'm like, go this weekend. I want you to go and watch a black, primarily 100% black casted movie. Yeah. How simple is that? Yeah. I had so many non, I had so many white employees go, oh my God, Patty, I've never turned on a movie that was primarily black cast. And they found these great movies that they had never you know, chosen to pick on Netflix or whatever. To me, that's what's fun. I don't want to sit and watch a bunch of movies about people that look like me or sound like me. I want to see. There's actually yeah, she doesn't want to watch movies where people who look and sound like her. She wants to hang out with them in person. Most of her, t most of the time that she's awake, but when she's on her free time, leisurely time, yeah, she, then she wants to be entertained by people who don't look and sound like her. Because she, she's learning about them. You know, I do. Indian culture, black culture, whatever it is. To me, that's exciting. So um, I teach that. Like, let's just be a little more cultural sensitive and cultural knowledgeable. And then you'll find your passion. It's pretty fun. It's pretty fun to be different, I think. <laughs> it is. And it, it makes you a uh, very interesting conversationalist, so to say. is because. Yeah, this is what this man says makes you an interesting conversationalist. This is this is the topic of discussion that's going to make you so interesting to so many people. Is when when it happens to me a lot of times is that I will come across someone who's like, oh, I watched just watched a Bollywood movie or something, and then they they would have they will have that cultural nuances. And the good thing is that we live in a country where all of this is possible. You can go to a restaurant that serves another food. You can watch, as you mentioned, you can watch a Netflix movie or a series that, that's in a different language and culture. And there's so much you can learn, which was very hard, I would say, about 10, 15, 20 years back when... Yeah, see? Bread and circuses. Literally. This is the fall of Rome. How do you learn about other cultures? Well, after I'm done hanging out with people who mostly look and sound like me, but some of you people, especially you more fair-skinned people, fair, more fair-skinned than her, for goodness sakes. There's, you know, it's like, you definitely shouldn't be doing that. But after I'm done doing that, I learn about, I, I effectively learn about other cultures and enjoy them by being entertained by them in, fic in mostly fictional movies and TV shows. And as that guy pointed out, yeah, and, and enjoying their food. They fed me. That's that's the value I get out of those people. Is that I, they they made me laugh and cry or whatever, and they satisfy my stomach. Community and business. Yeah. We did not have, did not have these options. Now, uh, changing lane here. You also work a lot on women empowerment, Patty, and and women empowerment somehow is kind of tied again to to home ownership. Single females accounted only for six, 7% of home ownership about 20 years back. They have jumped rapidly. I mean, they're one of the fastest growing demographics, so to say, at about 16, 17% of all home ownership. What's fueling that? How could single males have stayed in low single digits and that has stayed almost the same number? If anything, they have, they have actually gone down a little bit over the last 20 years, but single females seem to be doing very well with, with home ownership. What's going on there and where do you see the future of that? In a nutshell, because they decided to sacrifice their children at the altar of Molech and worship Mammon in a more groveling fashion, because you know, essentially women have traded husbands for the government and corporations, and men sadly are being completely de you know demoralized. And if you're stupid, you're going to walk away from the Lord God, who tells you to uh, be brave, be a man, like literally, like. Like God in multiple instances throughout the Old Testament tells even the same, even those who follow him, be brave, be a man. <laughs> Stand up. Endure. In other words, don't allow the world to emasculate you, to castrate you. Don't allow them to tear apart your soul. Well, you know, it's the same. It's the case for 
the same case for Latino lending is, um, you know, really being um, aware of what women are doing to rise career wise, right? Wealth wise, you know, it was a tough word for women to say a long time ago, I want to be rich. Mainly we remain, you know, we were, we were taught to rely on men for that. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm an American rich man. I mean, that was the narrative 50 years ago. That narrative is non-existent today, really. It's not anything I hear. Yeah, because our money's not worth anything compared to 50 years ago. And now women thought it'd be a very prudent idea to, to compete against their men. Go figure, yeah. That's, that's true community and business. Right there is good for community, it's good for the business. More so the business. And so we're just the emerging, we're the emerging, you know, I think um, at my age, I'm probably the first generation of self-made wealth builders yes. for a woman, you know, I'm pushing 60. So my children now see moms like myself, who they have role models that look like them, sound like them. And we, quite honestly, how could we rely on men to support us in most parts of this country? I mean, to buy a house in Southern California, <laughs> you know. So I think yeah right you hear that how can we rely on men it's we they can't afford to oh I mean really how can we rely on men they can't afford to buy a home so yeah that's we gotta well you well you know the drill and then yeah so then we can own homes and further yeah so here's the thing Every, so overall, there is a, there's an ethnic racial demographic shift, for sure, hands down. Reality is, it's only going to go so far for not so long, because, as you can tell, if, quote unquote, minorities start doing what the majority population is doing now, which is deciding to have the sexes separated, particularly women living, yeah, that's definitely a blessing, you know, women owning their own homes and being single residents long-term, meaning no more people, meaning all the minorities start to uh, fade away too in due time. There's good, there's good, there's good, there's a lot of good coming from this, but it's just, it's women empowerment because we're here and we're, and we've never not been here. It's just that we're in the workforce now and we're finding our voices and we're finding our strength and we're being acknowledged and we're being chosen. It doesn't go without saying. Yeah, usually the chosen. In the, uh, what, what they, she's also, she briefly mentioned earlier, by the way, is, yeah, you know, there's laws and private sector pressures for sake of government international funds to choose you as well so yeah we're being chosen voluntarily and involuntarily doesn't matter we're being chosen in that we have many more obstacles than men right we give birth to the world population oh man what an obstacle giving birth to the world population we have to make choices men don't have to make for the most part some men have to make some of the same choices um, you know, our bodies are used to create, you know, living creatures, yet we have to go back to work after two weeks. Our bodies create living creatures. Notice you can't say, you know, we create the world, we create the world population, our bodies create living creatures, can't say people, can't say humans, can't say babies. And we have to go back to work after, after two weeks. We have to make the money. You have to do this to make the money. I have to do this to make the money. It's all about the money three weeks. I mean, there's so much work to be done in our space. So me speaking out um, just about what it's been like my career, I think is really important, but we're buying more because we're making more, right? We're making more money and yeah. we're graduating college at a quicker base, at pace than Yay. men. So um, yeah, I think it's just going to continue to emerge. And like I said, if we want equality, we should have equality. There if we want equality, we should have it. Because remember what Jeff Hittenberger, remember, this is the or he is the, the the dean of the school of education training teachers targeting the orange county school district saying what love is activated 
when what matters to you matters to her matters to me if you want equality yeah we should have it i don't have to agree with it but i have to <laughs> yeah so totally i'm gonna emasculate myself just so then you can your voice could be heard or some some nonsense for some women that are perfectly happy being at home, being at stay-at-home moms, I champion them too. It's the hardest sure job do. in the world. It's the hardest job in the world. Yeah, the future is female for sure. I mean, let's let's, let's do a replay what he said just 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 for a moment. Job in the world. It's the hardest job in the world. Listen, to what he says. Yeah, the future is female for sure. I mean, yep. You hear that, folks? According to this guy, remember he's a millionaire too. Future is female. That's right. This is. Look at that face. You know, if, you know, if he wants to move ahead in life, and he's got to, he's got to hand over his testicles to the to to you know to the world system too. Yeah. Remember, this is. You think I'm criticizing the world? This is who Vanguard University, formerly of Southern California, but now of the Democratic Republican Commonwealth has on the side has partnered with has her name on the side of their building for business and management S claiming and promoting that they are going to they are preaching and teaching christianity a christ-centered mission this is this is it this is what this is what's going on it's not a quote unquote woke school, but this is what's going on. And as yeah. I rightly mentioned, I mean, 57% of university graduates are female now compared to only 43, which is the number which keeps rising. And Pew Research came up with some data recently where women finally, after, I don't know, thousands of years, are finally catching up to pay disparity. And then. Yeah, catching up the pay, you know, to like, you know, to like, to like, to, to the pay disparity while we're all in debt, the money's worth literally nothing. And what there's been the talks of a financial collapse with like ample evidence for like the last five plus years still going ongoing. That could be literally a depression right after I publish this. It's great. That's evolution. That's progress right there. There are some metro market where they are actually just slightly above some of the male graduates. So that's those are all encouraging signs, which means. If they were already showing those that kind of home ownership rate, uh, if anything, those numbers should should ideally be going up, even with all the challenges that you mentioned. That's right. We need we need more single female households, so we have fewer creatures. Uh, for the women, yeah. so definitely looking forward to that that world where the minority is majority, and of course, new American funding and you are playing a huge role into that. Any. Yeah, where the minority is the majority, including women, even though they're fifty percent of the population. Yeah, and you know, eventually, yeah, all you, all you whites out there, yeah, you'll be, yeah, you'll be the minority, and and then the other minor, and then the former minorities will start to start to mysteriously vanish into thin air <laughs> as as we as we celebrate the single female households growing in number. Yeah, see, in a nutshell, this is why, in my gross opinion, the overarching solution, as you'll see more for, evidence for later, is don't participate. Don't participate. In fact, Psalms 49, 11 through, two, through, through 20. In reference to people who, who, who pursue wealth, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations they call their lands after their own names wow it's like the lord knows us every square millimeter every every pixel of our dna nevertheless man being in honor abideth not he is like the beast that perish this their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. 
and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Be not, not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall, his in this case, in many cases her now, but his is in reference to what really, re realistically, because it's the old Engli older English, male or female. But don't forget that his or her, but his means his or her in this, you know, here as well. Don't forget that. His, gl his glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he bless his soul, and men will praise thee when thou goest well to thyself, doest well to, to thyself. He shall go to the generations of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not, man that is in honor, honored by everybody else, because of how D.I.E. they are, how, how worldly, loving, and wisdomly they are. Man that is in honor and understandeth not, does not understand what love and wisdom Or really, even what what the faith is, for that matter, is like the beast that perish. So really, what's all said and done? Don't envy these people. Don't even be that angry at these people. I feel sorry for these people. Just listen to them. Listen to them. They literally live off of bread and circuses. They they are is like the beast that perish. There's a reason why the Lord said, as, as you know, you know, before his, you know, before his passing, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Oy. To a degree, I do pity them. Now, next up is going to be a gentleman who, well, represents. So you saw a little bit more so of the local, state. And national. Now we're going to see a transition for Vanguard's connections to the national and international agendas. Oops, sorry about that. Ambassador Gaddy Vasquez is the descendant of migrant farm workers who instilled in him a strong work ethic and the value and reward of serving others. He was the first member of his family to earn a college degree and has been a lifelong advocate against world hunger, poverty, and disease. He's been a trailblazer as the first Latino named and elected to public offices and confirmed by the U.S. Senate to federal leadership positions. He most recently served as a senior vice president of government affairs for Edison International and Southern California Edison, one of the nation's largest investor-owned public util uh, utility companies. From 2002 to 2006, Ambassador Vasquez served as a director of the United States Peace Corps and became the third longest serving director in the Peace Corps' 62 year history. From 2006 to 2009, Gaddy Vasquez served as US ambassador to the United Nations Organization in Rome, Italy. His effective and decisive leadership prompted the director of the World Food Program to name Ambassador Vasquez as a champion against world hunger. His public service career includes service at the city, county, state, and federal levels. He has served as an appointee of three California governors and was appointed by President George H.W. Bush to two federal commissions, including the President's Commission on White House Fellowships. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Public Policy Institute of California, the Board of Trustees of Chapman University, the Board of Governors of the Orange County Community Foundation, and the Board of Directors of the Sagerstrom Center for the Performing Arts, the National Advisory Board of the Salvation Army, the Board of Directors of American Public Television Stations, and Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Aspen Institute Latinos and Society Program. He's a graduate of the University of Redlands and Santa Ana College and has served as a trustee professor at Chapman University. Ambassador Vasquez is the recipient of six honorary doctorate degrees. Class of 2023, family and friends, please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, 
my friend, Ambassador Gaddy Vasquez. And uh, that, that was President Mike Beals as of since 2013 when I graduated. So yeah, this is his friend and associate, close associate, supporter of Vanguard University of the Democratic Republican you know, Commonwealth, Gaddy Vasquez, the Honorable Ambassador Gaddy Vasquez. Before I begin my formal remarks, I just want to observe that there's a real sweet spirit in this place. It oh, and one thing they didn't, they uh, neglected to mention is that he's also board member of the IRI, the International Republican Institute. Fun fact, it's, it's actually nonpartisan. So it's Republican in the more classical sense. The word, think, uh, oh, lack of better terms, you know, early America, republicanism, French Revolution, republicanism. As well as their close partners with what's called the National Democratic Institution, also nonpartisan and, once again, democratic in the original American and French sense, too. That'll be important for later. It is an honor and a privilege for me, President Beals, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the faculty and staff, and ladies and gentlemen and class of 2023, congratulations on your graduation. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it. All right, so notice that unlike uh, the RVLOs, brings God and he brings God into the picture. This is where discernment is key. Not much discernment was necessary for the previous. So to me that's it's it's just open rebelling against the Lord versus this. Okay, I can I can see why, but when it comes to these situations, it comes to people in general, especially those who seem, remember Satan used scripture. Remember that. Because today we come together to celebrate your moment of accomplishment and triumph. You will have a very special place in the history of Vanguard University and you will be remembered for your perseverance, your determination, and personal commitment to reach this day, despite a pandemic which rocked our world in unimaginable ways. Yep, and that pandemic is, has been the springboard for international agendas going towards, well, a beast. It's strange how, remember that last verse we said, they die like the beasts? They die like beasts. And we're heading towards a beast system. Bread and circuses. Bread and circuses. For those of you who are Spanish deprived. By the way, he spoke, he, uh, he, he, he addressed the crowd in Spanish about two or three times for over a good solid minute each on, on each occasion. So yeah, for, for those of you who are Spanish deprived. I just congratulated the moms and dads and friends and loved ones of the graduates here today. As a first generation college graduate, I fully understand the sense of accomplishment and, and joy that you're feeling today. As was mentioned, I'm the descendant of a migrant farm working family. My parents labored in the agricultural fields of the Southwest to live and survive. Minimum wage and very difficult work. I grew up in a one bedroom trailer with no running water, no heating, no cooling, and no electricity. The electricity was borrowed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and it's sort of ironic because I went on to be a C-suite executive in an investor-owned utility company. <laughs> Neither of my parents graduated from high school. But what we lacked in material goods, 
we made up with lots of love and a whole lot of faith in God. My mother was the disciplinarian, as moms will be, and my father was a spiritual leader. His lifelong motto was, God will provide. And I was never disappointed. Never disappointed. And by the way, you'll see that when he says God, eh, remember, in God we trust, you have the money slash the government. The money slash the government, the public slash the private sector. You'll see what I mean pretty soon. Sounds hyperbolic. I wish. To you graduates, I say use your time wisely. Find your voice and always, always, always maintain the courage of your convictions. Find your voice, maintain the courage of the, the, the courage of your convictions, unless you oppose DIE. Never give up. Galatians 6 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We live in a nation where you can start, you can fail, start and fail and start over again. Some of the greatest men and women in history had to overcome adversity, doubters and cynics who cast doubt on what seemed like crazy ideas at the time. Yeah, want to hear, want to hear who the, who the people who are almost discouraged from their, from their dreams from what mattered to them. Imagine what the world would be like if Steve Jobs or Bill Gates had given in to the voices of critics who tried to drown out their vision of the future. Yeah, remember, remember Steve Jobs and Bill Gates' vision of the future? Boy, it's a good thing that didn't get drowned out. Or what if Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg and Jay Bezos had not pressed on with their vision endeavors and their projects? They never gave up, and they introduced us to technology and devices that are vital to our existence today. By the way, that's technology and devices which they self-admittedly said, yeah, we don't really let our closest friends and associates use them to a great degree, especially when they're children, because of the negative impact. But hey, community and money, sorry, business. Community is good for community is good for business. Mostly business. And if you're fortunate enough to be a trailblazer or the first to break through in the pursuit of your goals, resist decisions and conduct that will compromise your values and violate the tenets of your personal and public integrity and never underestimate the potential to make an impact. Because you never know. There could be a future president of the United States in this graduating class. And she may be sitting right next to you. Yeah, that's what we need. We need more female leadership. Men, you need to sit back. Just let the women do their work. Just like the Lord God said. You can tell I'm very sexist. Anyways. But the Peace Corps has always been about promoting peace, friendship, and understanding between the American people and peoples of the world. Our application soared. The demand exceeded our ability to deploy volunteers, and we achieved historic highs. Our country had been shaken to its core, but in true American fashion, we overcame evil with good works and restored faith, confidence, and trust in our nation's future while promoting peace and friendship around the world. And remember, he's, he's, he's referring to post 9-11. We overcame evil with good works post 9-11. Remember that. For those of you Generation Z, you, 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 you probably don't, likely don't especially never read any history about it, we, we totally didn't. Remember that Millennials and Generation X and Boomers and... Yeah, that, that sadly didn't happen. Peace, peace, but there was no peace. In this country and others, unfortunately. 
I urge all to never forget your Spanish, because as my dad used to famously say, two is better than one, and he insisted on us being bilingual. I yeah, fun fact, I'm actually uh, learning more Spanish at my fourth grade level right now. More so, I'm more, much better at reading it than, than like conversation. I'm half Mexican, so kind of comes with this animus, and I'm also do it for academic reasons as well. But if trends continue, if certain people um, keep deprecating themselves and decide not to have children, especially because of you know the Earth's gonna die or something, you know, so we can maintain the English-speaking population, that'd be great. So I don't have to worry too much about being that proficient. I thank God every day for the honor and privilege of being an American. While we are not perfect and we are not without blemish, we do remain the beacon of freedom. I'm talking about blacks and whites in general, by the way. Yeah, both of you. Stop killing your children. Have families. You know. And have a life, please. That way, like I said, I don't have to worry too much about speaking Spanish at a high level. Freedom and hope and a place on earth where we can enjoy the essence of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in this moment of achievement for you, I am reminded of Psalms 139 and 14. I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Wherever your life's journey takes you, you don't have to walk it alone. We serve a loving and gracious God whose mercy and light will guide you. You've come this far by faith and hard work. The world awaits you. Go out there. Make an impact. Dream big and do great things. God bless you, and congratulations. So this next clip it features is about three years, I can't, I'm pretty sure it's 20, late 2020 or early 2021, before the, and remember, because he was the ambassador for that of the Salvation Army. Yeah, so it's a little outdated, but no, it's actually very current, especially when you See his current associations with the Aspen Institute, which we're not going to feature here, the IRI, the International Republican Institute, and that gives you a pretty good idea. So, so this next clip gives you a really good idea on his on his domestic policy. Well, there are things like unconscious. Oh, so I'm going to increase the volume first. There you go. Bias which in a lot of instances may not be as apparent or as obvious, or may be the kind of person that you just alluded to. It says, I'm not. Uh, well, but, but there, are, there are individuals who, who believe, fully believe that they are. Sorry, we probably missed that part. Well, there are things like unconscious bias. There you go. So yeah, he, so yeah, he uh, believes and promotes, or just promotes, because let's say a lot of people don't really believe in this stuff. They just know that once again, it gets them ahead in life which in a lot of instances may not be as apparent or as obvious or may be the kind of person that you just alluded to. It says, I'm not. Uh, well, but, but there, are, there are individuals who, who believe, fully believe that they are not, but in behavior, in conduct, or, or just in phrasing of how things are communicated mm -hmm. clearly connotes uh, some sense of either discomfort or the disqualification of somebody else to a conversation, to a level of engagement because of their color. Mm -hmm. Or we may bracket people in certain categories. We may uh, generalize people and say, well, they're all like this. Well, they're, they're not all like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, all of us have to commit ourselves to not only check ourselves yes. and to examine our heart and our soul and, and come to terms with, well, maybe, maybe I do need to learn some lessons in life. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do need to adjust my thinking, my view, my perspective. Uh, and we have to also be willing to call those out around us whom we love, who we care about, uh, and our friends, our colleagues, our co-workers, uh, to call them out when these kinds of events, instances occur. And sometimes they're, they're conscious, which is, you know, 
revealing about the person and the individual and the challenges they have, but also sometimes it's not so apparent, but it manifests itself in other ways, and we've got to eradicate uh, that. Yeah, we got to eradicate it. By the way, uh, before he says this portion, he gave the example of how when he was leading the Peace Corps, that one of his socials, one of his uh, colleagues referred kept referring to him as Jose, even though he knew, knew his name was was uh, was Gotti. He kept referring to him as Jose. Now we can all he didn't say he was white, but we can all say to assume that he was, or maybe he wasn't. <laughs> maybe he wasn't. That's why he didn't mention his race whatsoever. But yeah. But yeah. So. That was his example of, we need to eradicate... Yeah, I mean, granted, that is disrespectful. I mean, just referring to somebody else by a different name other than the one that you... that, that they have. And fun fact, he said he talked to him about it and... eventually got resolved peacefully. So. But yeah, that kind of stuff. You know, that kind of stuff... that kind of evil needs to be eradicated. And he's gonna give... give methods for how this could be done. ...kind of an existence in our society because it's not, it's not helpful, it's not healthy, and frankly, it's, it's not godly. Mm. It, it, this kind of dialogue, this kind of reconciliation, this kind of empathy that we need to have one for the other, yes. that I can extend my hand to you and give you a helping hand or offer you a remedy for your problem regardless of your, of your color or your background, those are the kinds of things that we need to overcome. And that is still a work in progress in, in the United States, and it's also a work in progress in other parts of the world. And, and we continue to, to be challenged by all of that. And I, I've often said, you know, we need to, to remind ourselves that um, we all have a, 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 a permanent or temporary address. Permanent or temporary address. Yeah, remember, worldly minded. Permanent. No, no, I mean temporary. Sorry, temporary. Because after all, we are we are Christians in this room. Not not permanent. Temporary. Yes, uh, and it's called Earth. Yes. And we all live on this planet, and and yet uh, we seem to find uh, ways to create conflict and division, and those things need to be overcome. Uh, but I think having the dialogue, the narrative, the discussions, and then a plan of action that takes us to a place where not only does government come up or design the policies, the processes to help eradicate those conflicts, to, to invite or to, I should say, implement new practices in governmental agencies, just as law enforcement is going through the processing uh, or the process of examining uh, the policing that we have in America. So bear in mind, and somehow we keep coming up with all these different conflicts that, yeah, it's called sin, it's called, it's called the fall of man, it's called human depravity, it's called our rebellion against the Lord God. Especially a number of us are reprobates, meaning that we've just seared our consciences com completely and we'll stop at nothing to get what we want. And, and think about that. In Scripture, in the Book of the Romans, amongst other places, it makes it clear that there are people who literally at a point where they we don't know who they are we, we don't know who these individuals are but there but there are people who cannot repent they will not turn from their evil but remember according to jeff hittenberger the the dean of the school of education what matters to you matters to me that's and, and that's uh, activating or something like that i can't remember love but you don't have to agree with them but, you, but what matters to them matters to you. So imagine, so even reprobates, even degenerates, for some reason it just happens. I just can't imagine why. Is, is it the darkness of the hearts of men? I'm, I don't think so. No. Hence why, hence why, because it's not a sin problem, we need the government, including the law enforcement, to step in. Yep, that's what happens. And I think uh, most police chiefs of major cities in the country are now embracing the idea that we need to take a, a, a national look at policing and, 
in America as we have in previous iterations, but also to look at policing in our local communities because there are unique aspects of each community that are very distinct and different, uh, whether it's socioeconomic, uh, industrial versus residential. Yeah. The communities have different profiles, and I think it's imperative uh, to, to examine what your community looks like, what it feels like, and then you need to police accordingly uh, to be able to get to a great place. I think it's an interesting question because I think there are a lot of leaders in the higher academic area who are also asking the same question. In an evolving society where technology is evolving at such a fast pace, what kind of labor force do you produce? Yeah. Remember people, it's interesting. It's good to refer to people as creatures in comparison to God. But when men are referring to each other as creatures, or in this case, a uh, labor force, you gotta be wary of that. Uh, to meet the demands and the opportunities and the challenges of the new age labor market. Uh, new age labor market. It's not s semantics. In the sense that, as we all know, I think, or anyone who's who has studied this, and I've spent a few hours on it, uh, serving on the Board of Trustees at Chapman University and also on the Board of Governors of the California State University Foundation, is that um, you've got to have uh, the coursework and the availability of learning that has application to the new job market. And what's interesting today is that there are jobs that we know today that will not exist five years Correct. from now, and there are jobs that, that do not exist today that will exist five years from now. So the so yeah, notice, yeah, that's how we're, something to think about, that's how we're training people for jobs that currently don't exist. That, 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 that's called futurism, that's, that's called reimagining. We're going to train you according to what does not currently exist. And I mean specialized for that, by the way. The question is how do you how do you evolve the educational academic system? Uh, I think that's one of the aspects that needs to be addressed, uh, and and I know that that many institutions across America are grappling with it. Yeah. Uh, some are starting to question the merits of a college degree. Uh, is a college degree uh, really necessary? Well, thus far the statistics show that. Statistics show that what? Why is a college degree worth it? You probably already guessed the answer. The earning potential for someone with a college degree is still greater than someone who does not have a college degree. It's not okay to say that because... Yeah. That's the value of college degree, people. It makes you money. Doesn't make you any smarter or wiser. <laughs> or even more loving and God-fearing, but hey. <laughs> makes you more money. After all, you know, you need to make more, especially you women, you need to make more money because... It doesn't matter how hard a man works, he can't, he, you know, he can't buy a house to start a family. So you need to get out there and get a college degree so you can make more money too. When I was in public office as an elected official, uh, I, I would say to people, there are some decisions that you have to make that are pay me now or pay me later propositions. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you don't want to allocate the dollars to solve this problem today, it's going to cost you a whole lot more five or ten years from now when you then have to foot the bill to provide services, to provide support, uh, to build more jails, more facilities for incarceration, uh, and all the other consequences that we see societally when we don't prepare uh, uh, children, young people, to be competitive in a very competitive market. And with glo globalization, it's even more complicated. So, Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if, if we don't train them for globalization, which he promotes, by the way, then we're going to have to uh, buffer the welfare state. There, there is an imperative to seize the, the information that we are deriving from this, this challenging period in our lives as Americans and, and take, those, uh, that, take that data, that information, and translate it into public policy and funding that will address these issues. Uh, I, I believe in this, in this great country of ours. Uh, we are resilient, uh, we are capable, uh, but we've got to be willing to acknowledge that we've got to help each other uh, to be able to sustain a quality of life 
that is that is fair and equitable and accessible to all because as i like to say by the way that that quality of life is going to go down so hey but it's hey but it's fair and accessible and equitable for everybody it's going to go down but at least we're all going to have it you know everybody has not had an equal chance to live on main street usa and in my lifetime that's my aspiration is to work toward getting everybody to have a chance to live on main street usa the first recommendation I would make is that each and every one of us take ownership for our own behavior, our beliefs, and that which is the grounding that makes us who we are as individuals. Okay. All right, so see, look, so see, like I said, it's a synthesis. Notice this is going to be the, this conclusion is to be the synthesis. So that's more appeals to conservative, Republican, right wing, right? Okay. That we work without ceasing to eradicate the practices of discrimination, segregation, uh, of, of creating the divides that create the racial strife and challenges that we are seeing manifested. Uh, in okay, and see, that appeals to the left wing, the liberal, the progressive side, right? Various parts of our country. And, uh, and I would say that civic engagement is so critically important. And here's the synthesis. Here's how this is how you tie them together. Because voting and participating in the electoral process is the equalizer in our society. Yes. The ballot doesn't recognize your balance sheet, your income level, your whatever. Uh, we are all equal uh, in our electoral system, and it's important to do that. But I would also say that uh, whatever your faith, whatever your belief, uh, I also believe that it is important to pray for our nation. Yes. Uh, we are all Americans. Yes. We are blessed to live in uh, the greatest nation in the history of mankind. Uh, it's not without its blemishes. It's not yes. without its flaws. It's not without its missteps. But we need to pray for our nation. I was reading earlier today how uh, the father of our nation, George Washington, uh, went to prayer when he couldn't find answers in the political debate of his time. Yeah. Uh, President Lincoln was very open that when he couldn't find the answers and the solutions to the challenges of his time, he went to prayer. And I think that whatever our belief, whatever our faith, is taking pause to pray for our nation. Because when we pray for our nation, we're praying for our neighbor. We're praying for that person down the street who is suffering from racial discrimination, who is enduring the challenges of life today. Once again, left, right wing appeal, left wing appeal. Who is unemployed, who is being challenged, or their children. If we pray as a collective society, uh, I am told through the scriptures that he will hear us and he will answer our prayers. If we humble ourselves and we seek his face and we pray, uh, we will get the answers that we need. But we must do this uh, in order to be able to bring our good thoughts, our hopes and our aspirations to a better place. And from that, we will emerge stronger and better and more vibrant. Yep, there you have it. <laughs> The one world system, baby. This, this, this is the current religion. This is, this is, this is, this is a prototype. This is, this is the alpha, if not the beta phase of the one world religion. Right. Um, I All right, so here's the thing. He's also part member of the board of the... Public Policy Institute of California, an elected body of nonprofit which has significant influence over state, if not indirectly, national welfare as well. So, so yeah. So once again, this is this is who Vanguard University, of the Democratic Republican Commonwealth associated with if not good friends just wanted to begin today by providing a little bit of background information on how schools are funded in california and what the local control funding formula is um, that we're talking about and so i think it's useful to begin before even talking about the formula to just understand where school funding comes from in california and there are three primary sources there's state dollars there's local dollars and there's federal dollars and state dollars Bear in mind that this is this was this was posted re 
recently. Like, like, a, like a little more than a month ago. So here, California schools are funded by a mix of state, local, and federal funding. As you can see, majority is is from this is from the state general fund, other monies, the lottery. Yep, even the lottery. Imagine that gambling also <laughs> is also the budget part of the budget for this. <laughs> All right, local property taxes, other taxes and fees. 30 to 35 percent it's about a third and federal only makes up 69 percent title one meals high in pandemic slash recessions so bear in mind this is the this is basically the bribe money that the federal government gives to swing people their ways and to also make uh, people more more uh, dependent on the system sessions or periods otherwise of economic and financial distress. And so that's how schools are funded. Now, what about the funding formula? What is this weighted formula? Oh, I'm sorry. How was that? Sessions or periods otherwise of economic and financial distress. And so... Yeah, so before we get to the other one, to the other one. So here's... So notice, this is the current funding for California. Ten years ago, local control fund formula (LCFF) brought fundamental, brought fundamental shift. Very similar to the mind shift that was uh, brought to the ACSI Association for Class for Christian Schools International and their associates, including the Church of England Schools and Cardis of Canada, as well. A lot of shifts going on in education. People, they all seem to be just coincidentally happening around the same time, amongst the. Christian and non, non and non Christian circles alike around the world. All right, so increased funding for high need students, as in low income English learners and foster youth. How's it weighted? Districts with more high need students get more money. Simplified funding formula, greater flexibility. Less reliance on restricted funding items. So great flexibility meaning you know there's less discretion, if not accountability, for where that money goes. Which he this gentleman uh admits to briefly. Spending is now sixty-five percent higher per student. How much higher? Well, back in 2012 through 13. So a decade ago, a student in California received 14, in public schools, received $14,245 a year. As of 2021 to 22 and a little higher now, $22,684. Did you hear that? A decade ago it was fourteen thousand two hundred forty-five. Now it's twenty-two thousand plus dollars. And yet, the school system is still utterly failing. But once again, due to the simplified funding formula, which means less discrepancy and accountability. Keep in mind that the average high for a private school including amongst a majority white student body is 10 grand. The tuition is 10 grand. The little private school I go you know, that I teach at here in small town Arizona is eight a little over eight thousand dollars for a high school student. So yeah so if you thought that the schools were getting overpaid well, here you go. I want to show this slide because it's ample evidence that really it's... Duh. Uh, we're gonna skip this one because basically it's the worse off your students are, the more money that you get. So you get literally bribed more money the worse your, your students are. AKA they can't read or write or really do anything. Once again, little, little discretion and accountability of where those, those like funds go.
So then what do we know about the impacts of the formula, at least so far in its first decade? Um, and there's a few things that I'll point out. And first is that when we look specifically at these dollars targeted for high need students, we find that especially the concentration grant funding has led to improved student outcomes, higher test scores, higher graduation rates, higher, rate, higher rates of college course readiness. Um, and that you know, is something that comes from research that we've done at PPIC as well as others you know, at UC Berkeley and other institutions. But the second thing is also that not all of these additional funds for high need students are necessarily reaching the high need students in schools in the proportion uh, that the formula would dictate. It's a mystery and so, too. You know, why does that matter? We're targeting funding to districts, but it matters how they then distribute that funding across their schools and their students and their programs. And this kind of relates to some of the more you know, long-standing achievement concerns, both in terms of the level of performance, as well as achievement gaps that have you know, predated LCFF um, and actually become exacerbated during the pandemic. So, so bear in mind, and Mr. Vasquez, Ambassador Vasquez said that we need to allocate funding, especially, especially towards public education. Yeah, it's currently twenty-two plus thousand dollars per student. Not all of the additional funds for high need students are well targeted. AK actually gets to them directly for their purposes, and we don't really know why or how. I guess it's just a mystery. Remember, these people don't believe in sin, so we can't really point the finger and or call people out especially when they believe in DIE and flourishing and all that jazz. So I guess you just move on and you just ask for more money to replace the money that's not hitting the target. I'll, I'll leave us with this. Okay, well, what do we want to know then looking forward into the next decade of LCFF about the state's funding formula? And as I mentioned, these concerns around targeting are fundamentally about this balance between autonomy at the district level and accountability uh, from the state level. And so what is the right balance there? Should the state provide more of a, dick, you know, more of a, you know, uh, more of a sense of how these funds should be targeted or not? Or should districts have kind of the autonomy and the flexibility to distribute them as they see fit? I think that's an ongoing both kind of policy concern as well as a political one. And then thinking more generally about the challenges that we face, you know, does the formula need some sort of retuning, for example? Um, is the base level sufficient? Yeah, it's the base level of $22,000 sufficient. Remember, that's annual. It's the annual budget per student. Is the amount of funding that we give to high need school sites rather than districts um, sufficient? Are there different weights should we should put on different students or should we define high need differently than we do today? I think these are all conversations that have been happening that have been considered. And they relate to some of the most ongoing, you know, pressing ongoing challenges we have around learning recovery from the pandemic, around declining enrollment, and around shortages um, in critical staff and educators at our school. So remember, Ambassador Vasquez sits on, the, sits on the board of this organization, and they're the ones who came up with and helped put forth this, this unelected body of people consisting of those who directly influence, if not administer education. <laughs> yeah, we just, yeah, it's like, it's strange. We just don't know, we just don't seem to know why the money's just not reaching these kids. It's funny, I guess the solution is just to ask for more. In fact, uh, here's the superintendent. Pandemic around declining enrollment and around shortages um, in critical staff and educators at our school. To allow family members to be part of the decision making about how these dollars get spent. Um, the, the LCAP process um, is a great way to engage our interest holders, our students, our families um, in making decisions um, about um, how the money gets spent. Is it a perfect system? Yeah, well, yeah, unless it actually, whether, well, well, you know, when it actually gets to them, for them, direct, like, for their immediate actual needs, resources for them. Uh, no, um, it certainly, though, has moved us um, in a great direction, and I think we have a, a lot more work to do to get our students to be our state to fund schools um, in a way where we can be number one, because our kids are number one. And what I learned as a legislator is that you show your values by what you put in your budget. 
And so when we can get things to be number one, and I know that we don't endorse ballot measures in this audience, but I think that we can move a ballot measure that will close loopholes in Prop 13 and get us the kind of revenue that we need to help close the gap for our students. Yep, Steve, just need to get more money and close that gap. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, sake of time. This gentleman right here is gonna lay it down for us pretty, summarize it for us pretty well. He's a current Calvary State legislator. So I completely agree with, with both of what they said. I think we have to continue to increase funding and opportunities in the career technical education space. I think that's something I'm working with a number of my colleagues on in the legislature. We have a bipartisan bill moving forward to increase access to career technical education. Um, it is something that, uh, you know, it's also about, you know, to the previous question as well, it's also about improving access uh, when it comes to internet. Um, I think particularly in the rural communities, uh, when, when the pandemic hit, that was especially uh, problematic and my district partnered with Verizon to get hotspots to everyone but I think the superintendent's right we can't hotspot our way out of this problem um, one thing the legislature has been doing is uh, holding the PUC accountable uh, for rolling out broadband dollars in a technology neutral way uh, I think in the places of the state where broadband makes sense we need to be able to do that but we, in the more rural communities we also need to be willing to adapt and adopt different technologies that may may include fast internet but maybe not broadband but still be able to use some of that funding and so uh, getting creative about the ways that we're increasing that access in our state um, but it's also to the superintendent's point about partnerships between community colleges that's right. and K through 12. That's right. Uh, I think that's critical and, and, and our private partners, that's right. our workforce, that's right? right. We and our private partners, our, our workforce. Yeah. Let's put it this way. I'd rather be called a derogatory like after, I've been alive for over 32 years now, I would rather be called a derogatory racial slur than be labeled workforce. Because when it's all said and done, I can shrug off the slur, but being viewed as a workforce? Yeah, that's, that's, that's not, that is not conducive to my welfare or anybody else's in the long term whatsoever. We need to fully, we need to have advisory groups on the ground, and I know we do in many cases, but of community college representatives, school, rep, uh, you know, K through 12 representatives, and workforce partners in, in every region to say, this is the, these are the employees that we're looking for, these are the opportunities we have available that students can make an, a great wage coming out of high school or coming out of certification program. Remember, because it's, about, it's good for community and business especially business. And we need to all get, get everyone on the same page in providing those opportunities. Thanks. All right, so this last... Second. Opportunities. All right, so this last segment is, remember, Mr. Vasquez sits on the board of the IRI, the International Republican Institute of Members. That's not Republican. Party is Republican nonpartisan, and there, and this, and this is actually published, posted not too long ago this year either. And they're partnered with the National Democratic Institute. It's like they're mocking us. Yeah, these are both NGOs that promote, well, democracy globally, and strangely enough, for being nonpartisan, they like to work closely with the federal government. In fact, they've been working with both Republican and Democrat administrations for decades. So, once again, unelected bodies of people, currently mostly female leadership, and a large portion of them, prior taking up their positions, worked for International organizations, including the United Nations, the World Bank, and the World Health or Organization. 
but bear in mind they're based in the United States and they are supposedly representing American interest. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, <clears throat> and welcome. On behalf of NDI and IRI, I'm absolutely thrilled to open this event. It comes at an extremely important moment for the Global Fragility Act. <clears throat> As many of you are aware, President Biden and the White House transmitted the GFA country strategies to the Hill on Friday representing the culmination of an enormous effort by many of you on this call in the U.S. interagency, at embassies, and leaders in civil society in GFA countries and the West Africa region. <clears throat> Congratulations to all of you. NDI and IRI carefully selected the focus for this event, citizen-centered governance, because we think Citizen centered government is basically the equivalent of, of all animals are, are created equal. This is the essential goal for the U.S. partnership with the GFA counterpart countries. <clears throat> countries are stable when state society relations produce policy outcomes that citizens view as effective and legitimate. The institutions that NDI and IRA work with legislatures, political parties, local governments, independent electoral bodies, all help to shape and strengthen these important state society relationships that are so central to citizen responsive governments. As we inaugurate <clears throat> the second Summit for Democracy this week, it is really important to understand the linkages between democracy strengthening and climate prevention. See, once again, once again, right wing, left wing synthesis. The summit offers important opportunities for us not only to advance democracy globally, but also to reduce and prevent violent conflict, which has become a greater risk as a result of the COVID pandemic and the effects <clears throat> of poverty, inequality, and marginalization. I would now like to introduce Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, Azra Zaya, who has taped opening remarks for this event. Under Secretary Zaya has dedicated her professional career to strengthening democracy and advancing human and democratic rights. She has served as President and CEO of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and during her multi decade career in the Foreign Service, she has served as Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. I will now turn it over to Under Secretary Zaya to discuss the importance of democracy for stability and peace. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I wanna to start by thanking our esteemed hosts, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, which continue to be indispensable partners. They have been at the forefront of democracy promotion and conflict prevention for decades, and we're lucky to have their expertise. Additionally, I wanna recognize the participation and invaluable contributions of our partner country panelists. Your leadership, both in and out of government, helps us strengthen inclusive, responsive governance and build more peaceful, prosperous communities. While we all have diverse perspectives to bring to the table, we all strive to promote democracy, enhance accountable governance. Well, yeah, right, until, until you don't know where the money or anything goes, or the weapons, the money, the weapons goes and, oh, well, just gotta get more money and make more weapons, I guess and prevent cycles of conflict and instability. It's this shared desire that inspired the Global Fragility Act and the associated US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. This strategy serves as a framework to forge enduring strategic partnerships around the world and to foster peace. I'm pleased to share that we have completed and President Biden has submitted to Congress 10-year plans for advancing partnerships with the strategy's focused countries and region. And now the hard work of implementation begins. 
We will marshal and integrate diplomatic efforts and foreign assistance initiatives to promote peace and resilience in new ways. We will reform how the United States engages partners using data and evidence to inform policymaking. Just like they did during 2020, and just like they do now for education, it's data-driven ed education. Remember, you're a labor force, so your numbers, you're all, we're, all, we're all digits, people. We will better integrate diplomatic development and security sector efforts. As we speak, Vice President Harris is making a historic visit to one of these partner countries, Ghana. So fun fact, in case you didn't know, France has been suffering from, um, well, migrant, Muslim gangs tearing up, which, which are the primary cause of tearing up and burning and looting much of the country earlier this summer. And so France is losing its grip on Western Africa. To, in a bid to ensure that Western Africa does not fall into competitive rival Eastern circles, hence you have this Global Fragility Act in which the Biden administration is trying to reach out and incorporate, keep Western Africa within as much as possible within the, within the Western North American sphere of influence. The vice president is highlighting our commitment to help Ghana and other West African nations take a holistic approach to address the growing threats of violent extremism and instability. Together, we're working to advance a shared vision that combines inclusive governance, responsive security, and locally driven peace building to promote resilience in the region. The Summit for Democracy is the ideal venue to highlight this critical linkage between democratic governance and conflict prevention. Through our strategy implementation, President Biden reinforces our commitment to strengthen democracy's ability to deliver for their people and prevail over 21st century challenges from climate and pandemic related disruptions to authoritarian overreach. Yeah, keep in mind, we're still we're, we're still fighting tyranny. We're still fighting dictators. We're still fighting communism. We're just not saying communism. But we are have we are fighting rivals and enemies, nations that happen to be communist. The strategy highlights that instability and conflict are inherently political problems. Accordingly, sustainable stability depends on strengthening effective, inclusive governance that upholds human rights. Democratic, inclusive governments, in turn, are a source of resilience, which provides a foundation for successful and sustained development progress. And bear in mind that development progress is economic uh prime you know prime you know primary especially for you women you, you need to get out there and make more money this initiative and related programs will expand u.s engagement in the focus countries and region on democracy governance and inclusion the initiative also entails elevating our commitment to combat corruption in line with the u.s strategy on countering corruption yeah we're u.s strategy of countering corruption Sounds like a oxymoron these days, doesn't it? The challenges facing democracies today require more integrated approaches. In implementing our strategy, we're seeking to better integrate conflict prevention and peace building alongside development in support of democratic governance, political inclusion, inclusive economic development, accountable security, and respect for human rights. Strategy implementation will entail ongoing consultative processes with civil society and with local and national leaders in each of the partner countries. We will work in coordination with the many actors and stakeholders who can help achieve our common objectives. Bear in mind, stakeholders doesn't mean everybody, it means only some people. Of more peaceful, prosperous, and stable communities and countries. To this end, We've sought to align our efforts with and support 
national government plans where possible, recognizing that the process of building resilience and fostering peace is a shared one. Today's discussion provides an opportunity to consider how we can better synchronize our collective efforts. We take very seriously the need to engage with civil society organizations moving forward. We are focused on forging partnerships at the local level, including with women and youth to drive change in their communities. Yeah, see, remember that. Women and youth, you gotta drive change in your communities. You're gonna wear pants, you're gonna make money, and you're gonna own homes and be single in those homes long-term. That's, that's, that's how you're going to drive change. Oh, and don't, don't forget to, to emasculate your men and sell your souls for money. With funding appropriated by Congress, we're advancing new programs to engage with marginalized communities to elevate their participation in political and economic processes. The Summit for Democracy provides a critical forum to reaffirm our shared commitment to strengthening democracies both emerging and established. We know that democratic governance reduces fragility, advances sustainable development, and mitigates violent conflict and instability. Yeah, it's quite simple. It's like, it, does, it does facilitate all those things. You just gotta dumb down the population, uh, make them infertile, and uh, have them forget that the Lord God said, be fruitful and multiply. Oh yeah, and, and totally disregard you know sin and salvation given by Lord and Savior Jesus, you know Jesus Christ, like that. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, that's how you have a very docile and stupid population. Together, we need to demonstrate that democracy, respect for human rights, and non-discrimination can deliver for all people. Today's panel will help us all better understand how we can do this together. As representatives of governments, civil society, the private sector, philanthropy, and international institutions, we need your support, your knowledge, your experience, and your advocacy to help strengthen our common purpose. No, you can keep your money and your mammon and and your and your testicle cutting and your and your uh, mammary smashing and. Now you can do that. I'll be over here where the Lord's going to provide for me for my needs. And my faith isn't founded in my stomach or in laughing or crying with, from enjo with enjoyment, but actually from my soul and heart being satisfied by his glory. As he redeems me from the evil of my heart. And thus, you know, the, the, the redemption and sanctification of my, of my, you know, of my household. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you can go, go find some other fresh life blood to help sustain your common purpose, purpose some, somewhere else. I'll be content with whatever he gives me for my daily bread. Thank you very much. Democracy is not static. Yeah, I know. I know the rules change every other week, it seems. It must be nurtured and supported to overcome challenges. And true modernization requires that we continually iterate and adapt our approaches. I thank you for your time and your commitment to supporting our strategy and helping it forge a more peaceful and democratic future. Yep, U.S. Department of State. Thank you. I want to thank Undersecretary Zaya for sharing these insightful remarks. My name is Kimber Shear, and I am the Executive Vice President at IRI. Yep, I know, I know. Just one of the many women who are shoring up these should have failed organizations because you should be home right now taking care of your families and raising your children to not be a workforce, to not be a dependent wards of the state. But hey, your 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 religion, your God, is the private public sector, aka the prototype of the B system. So I guess I don't respect that, and I don't agree with that, and I definitely don't value what matters to you right now. 
We are delighted to convene this dialogue on a topic that we are all committed to, how strengthening democracy is key to promoting peace around the world. As the Summit for Democracy brings together leaders to discuss the world's most pressing challenges, it is vital that we take action toward democratic renewal, including by supporting the implementation of the Global Fragility Act. The GFA rightly makes elevating democracy, human rights, and governance a guiding principle. IRI's decade of experience across the globe and our current support in GFA countries substantiates this approach and focus and reflects the reality that conflict is political. Weak state legitimacy and institutions and exclusionary socio-political dynamics enable chronic fragility and exasperate grievances. Some predatory regimes impose these vulnerabilities and fuel conflict by undercutting political oversight, feeding corruption, and committing human rights abuses against. Like, like, like you, like Ukraine, right? No, fun fact: if you go to the RI website, they're actually trying to uh, defend the government of Ukraine during this conflict with Russia. Russia is the authoritarian. You know, dragon that then file means I don't know appreciation for much appreciation for Putin whatsoever, but yeah, keep in mind that yeah, yeah we're yeah we're against corruption. Does that include you you uh, Ukraine Zelensky? No. Oh, you're in support of him and his government. Okay. Okay, so you and I have a completely different idea of what corruption is. Then that's 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 where this lack of communication is. And their citizens. Ultimately, this intensifies the drivers of conflict. When individuals view governing structures and actors as illegitimate, they are more susceptible to be recruited and mobilized by, by violent actors. These existential global threats to democratic development are evolving in ways which will require innovative approaches to overcome. You hear that? If you're dissatisfied with the corruption or the perceived gun, oh, I'm sorry, she looks bad. In there we go. She looks bad. If, you, if you're if you're dissatisfied with the corruption, with the perceived corruption of your democratic government and society, well then you're just a you're just a potential pawn for some domestic or international terrorist. So thereby, we got coming up with innovative ways to suppress you, if not possibly, as Mr. Pastor Vasquez says, Vasquez says possibly even uh, arrest and indict you as, as well. Recognition of these conflict drivers, advancing democracy and governance is key to promoting stability and reducing conflict. Responsive institutions connect the citizens to the state and thus act as peaceful mechanisms for political contest, resource allocation, and conflict mediation. And civil society and media promote critical reforms, open avenues for peaceful conflict mitigation, and strengthen, strengthen social cohesion among divided society. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that I don't, I don't have a script, and she clearly does. The GFA places local perspectives from government and civil society at the forefront. To that end, we are fortunate to have some of the brightest minds in the GFA target countries here with us today. I look forward to hearing the panelists' perspectives on these issues. IRI and NDI are dedicated to supporting the U.S. government in its implementation of the Global Fragility Act, and we look forward to continuing our partnership as the country plans are being implemented. Are being implemented. And remember, NDI and, and IRI were active during the Trump administration, Obama, Bush, Clinton, George W. Bush, even Reagan. So, this has been going on for quite some time. It's going on for quite some time. All right. So, so let's conclude with just wanna center this real quick. There I we think go. Oh great, no, I don't wanna look at you. There we go. There we go, just ending on ending on with this image. Yeah, let's look at that. 
is it says uh, that Indian gentleman talking to Mrs. Arielle said, look at that. Look at this crowd. So men, yeah, see, this is what happens when uh, you don't stop Eve from taking the fruit. This is what happens when you eat the fruit. This is what happens when you listen to your women and do what they tell you because a creature told them something random that was clearly against what you should be doing and it was actually a worse idea than what you what the Lord said to do which was hey here's paradise be fruitful and multiply just don't eat that tree yeah this is what happens this is what happens when you don't wear the pants this is what happens when you don't gird up your loins this is what happens when you're not a man So, here we are. Once again, it doesn't have to be this way for your household. If the rest of the world wants to do that, fine. It's not doing that within my four walls, my wife, and Lord, indeed, please bless me with my children, my future children. They want, if they, if, they, if they want a workforce for their common purpose, they can go elsewhere. Over my cold, dead hands. With that said, our concluding passage is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Listen carefully. And seek the Lord. And like me, repent. And become more of the man, or more of the woman. You know that it commands you to be. Verse 13, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a, di or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and build greater, and there will be I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So for all you men out there saying, I'm going to go my own way and make money and... Live it, live it up. You know, you know, you know, the heck with these wenches. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Yeah, go ahead and accumulate all that crap. After you're dead, who's getting it? Meanwhile, what happens to you? Was it worth it? Did you stick it to the woman? Did you stem the tide of... Is that how you stem the uh, tide of uh, being demographically replaced because you decide to be sterile and worship bread and circuses? To bow before the altar of mammon? While feigning faith? The false love and a worldly wisdom for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I may not have much in particular compared to many people, but I am a rich man. I'm at peace. 
My soul is sound. My heart is merry. And I'm learning to love the woman in my life more and more each month, each passing year. And may we love our children and 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 do train them, girls and boys, to become men and women, braver and wiser and more loving, able to stare down the beast more so than I could have ever done in my life. May they be a holier, stronger, the more righteous generation. This is the first and last place where the Lord reigns forevermore. Glory be to God. This is Christian M.C. Fulmer, signing out.